Good day, Brutal Planet listeners. This is Eric Peterson, and today is a good day. Why, you ask? Every day is a great day when you get to see the sunrise. But bonus today, we get to speak with one of my idols, Mr. Steve Vai. How are you doing today, Steve? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Eric? Good, good. Um, I'm lucky to be chatting with you today because I know you had surgery Friday, right? Mm-hmm. How did it go? It go? You know what? It went so much better than good. we expected. Yeah. I mean, if they, they, uh, sometimes I look into the press now and I'm, I'm reading really funny things about <laughs> situation so maybe i can kind of clarify some things in a nutshell uh it it started years you know it took many years decades to get my shoulder in a condition where it needed help yeah when it did a year ago this this december i went and i had these three tendons fixed and it was great you know they healed and i was able to actually start playing in a couple of weeks Mm-hmm. But they, actually, I started playing the day I got home. I recorded, uh, started recording Knapsack. Yeah. Because I only had one hand. And, um, they, it, but these kinds of things, they take like a year to fully heal. Yep. So I, I was able to record and I recorded in Violet. Uh, but over the summer, while I was recording, I, <laughs> I was making pizza. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And uh, believe it or not, I wish I had a better story, but uh, you think you're okay, you know, uh, when you're feeling good, but you're it's still healing. And I did yeah. this stupid thing, you, know, you got to pull the, pull the spatula out so the pizza goes in the oven, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I gave it three really good jerks and that wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, and I, I retore, uh, well, they thought I retored the the tendon where the surgery was. And so this surgery was going to be a lot more complicated because what they have to do is they, they put a skin patch in there. Okay. And it takes like 16 months to heal. But when he got in there the other day, he realized that it, it wasn't a re tear. It was a new, a new tear. So he was able to just sew it up and uh, yeah. So I'm doing great. I'm, you know, I'll be playing again in a couple of days, but I'm not going to be making pizza. (laughs) <laughs> well, if you want, we can edit that all out and say that you were saving your dog from a cougar or something, and that's how you retort it. We can get better than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll do better. I like, I like the cougar angle. Maybe we were like, I don't know, saving Paris Hilton from a exactly. cougar or something. Exactly. <laughs> well, I just have to tell you, I'm not a musician, so I won't be asking you any technical questions, which may be good or may be sad for you, because it's like a foreign language to me. Um but I have well, to you got some very colorful bands on the back wall there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, these are all, when I go take photos of artists, I, next time I see them again, I ask them to sign stuff for me. So, I, so yeah. So, so you will be on that list one of these days. All right. So, uh, but that being said, I've been a fan of yours since the Alcatraz days. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Um, First things first, I, I, I have to say, no matter what, who, however long I've known somebody, I do a little research. And I was listening to your interview with Eddie Trunk, and I wanted to slap him. I wanted to reach through the computer and slap him because he didn't know that you played on an Alice Cooper song. Ah, uh, yes, but neither did I. Uh, I forgot. He had said, I thought that... Um... The Feed My Frankenstein was the only one. And then some somebody said, no, you played on Bulldog, too. And I'm like, oh, that's right. <laughs> Sorry, Alice. <laughs> but then but then I the funny thing was, is I realized that really wasn't even an Alice Cooper song. It was a Zodiac and the and the Mind Warp and the Love Reaction song. That's right. So but it'll always be an Alice Cooper song. It will. Me. It will. <laughs> So let's talk about your new studio album. It's your ninth studio album. It's called In Violet. Um, I love the title and I love the definition of the of the word, unable to be harmed. Um, you mentioned your knapsack. I like my shoulder. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the, the knapsack. Would you Matt, mind telling everybody a story, sharing that with our listeners about how you came up with the name of that song? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, the, the, the doctor I had for my shoulder's name is Dr. Knapp. K-N-A-P-P. And he developed this very thing that I'm wearing that's specifically for people that have this kind of cuff work. 
and he, he calls it the knapsack. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got back from, in December after the first surgery, I, uh, well, I was sitting there and um, um, I don't have a guitar set up or else I'd show you, but um, I uh, just received the new black Onyx Pia, okay. which was this gorgeous instrument, you know, black and gold. And I'm sitting there and I'm like so frustrated because I can't play it. And I'm like, Shit, you know, and I'm just like, well, wait a minute. I could play, you know, it, if you have the kind of style I have where it's kind of like very legato and you're hammering a lot. I know you don't know those terms because you're not a musician, but you know, no, I, I know the words. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So it's not difficult, you know, yeah. um, the, 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 the tricky part is finding a good melody and making us making it a song that uh, isn't a novelty song or a gimmick. You know, I, I knew that when I decided to do this, that the song was number one, you know, you have to be able to enjoy it without, well, without knowing that it's being played with one hand. Yeah. You know, so I, I did my best and, um, I didn't really think much of it, you know, I, 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 I like the song a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but it was also at a time when we were all in lockdown and artists were, you know, wanted to reach out to their fans and offer something because everybody was, you know, de depressing and all this stuff. And uh, I started uploading a lot of stuff and Knapsack was probably later because I'd uploaded candle power before that which made it to inviolate also but when i when i uploaded knapsack long before inviolate came out and i made the little video yeah i was i was surprised at uh, the response it was very well received so uh, when you, very, I, i'm picturing yeah. you're gonna play that song live when you go back out on the road what will you be doing with your other hand when you're doing that <laughs> Some people have been asking me that. <laughs> well, I, uh, I was con I was actually at one point I was considering coming out on stage with the knapsack. Oh, OK. And playing the whole song. But it, it's a little complicated to put it on. It's not that yeah. easy. And I, that's kind of wanky to do something like that. Yeah. So I, um, I, 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 I there's you know, there's a couple of parts in the song that I cheated uh, for when you will look at the video, meaning uh, there's like one riff where I'm uh, I'm using a sustainer, uh -huh. you know? and there's like there's like two or three riffs where I I had to have somebody come and hold the neck so the strings wouldn't vibrate. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, because that's that's hard to do, and yeah. I I became very good at that, but there were some things that it just was like, mm, it can't do it, you know. But just yeah. like two riffs, uh, so. You know, I, I don't feel like I need to go out there and play every note with one hand now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll probably use my hand to turn the sustainer on and off and maybe mute those extra parts. It might be a good but, chance for you. you. Maybe you could bring somebody up from the crowd and have them do that one little part for you. <gasps> Eric, I think you're onto something. <laughs> you know what? I think you are. Yeah. How cool would that be? Wouldn't it that be would. funny? It would be fun. I just got to make sure they don't screw it up. Yeah, yeah. Because there's some spots where I need open strings. That's why I never put the. But that is really cute, cute idea. I might explore that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I always try to come up with 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 something. So. Well, you might be that guy. Maybe. <laughs> it might be my. It might be my only chance to actually say that I played an instrument. You could say you. You played with Steve Vai. Exactly. Sort of. Exactly. <laughs> sort of <played> with him. <laughs> well, the, the, the new album, um, also, The Teeth of the Hydra was a great song, and it's known to raise skeletons from the dead. Do you, did you have anyone in mind when you wrote that song? Teeth of the Hydra? Yeah. Well, the, the song title came about from my uh, affection for those old... 70s clay animation movies like clash of the titans i wondered if that's Hercules. where it went yeah well, well you know jason and the argonauts. Jason the argonauts yes that's where i got it from okay jason fights the hydra and then after he slays the hydra the bad guy comes along and takes the teeth of the hydra uh-huh he plants them and then the children of the hydra arise you know and the children of the hydra are these like 
skeletons that run around and torment uh, Jason and the, the guy. I remember that. Okay. I, yeah. I wondered if that's where that came from. That's exactly where it came from. So, uh, but really the, the song title came first. Well, no, 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 no. The guitar, the naming the guitar came first. When I saw the guitar, when it finally arrived, everybody was called, we were calling it the steampunk guitar. Okay. You know, I'm talking about the Hydra. Have you seen yeah. it? Yeah, I have. Yeah. So uh, then I just, I, I knew I had to name it and I just looked at it one day and said, that's, a, that's the Hydra. Nice. You know, and then I thought, well, I need a song immediately, Teeth of the Hydra. So then I constructed the song based on what the title was telling me. Okay. Yeah. So everybody, we're starting back up again. And okay. now, um, so good for us to, to share a little bit on the inside. Well, folks, I just showed Eric me performing a little clip on the Hydra for so the so Hydra. back to the Hydra mm -hmm. you created the beast are, are you going is it something you're just going to have a one off of or are you going to create it so that other people can try no the the Hydra is a one off it's a highly okay. technical instrument it uh it took a long time to build it's it's uh, a lot of engineering Besides, you know, it's got the 12 string neck that's half fretless, the seven string, the, the bass neck that's half fretless and the 13 harp strings. It had to be constructed in a way that it was playable, you know, but it also has like a whole MIDI section and synth section and it has piezos and sustainers and sample and hold features. And it's, it's, it's an extraordinary instrument. You, you, you could, a person could probably have one made probably not by Ivan as you know, because it would be extraordinarily expensive. Yeah. But um, uh, I might assume that I'm going to, I may start to see people building something similar, but triple neck guitars, don't, it, it, there's nothing unique, you know, it, yeah. it, the, the Hydra has some unique features, but, but uh, the same thing applies when I was writing the song, I wanted uh, the song to be able to stand on its own as an enjoyable piece of music and not a gimmick for a guitar. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. But I mean, it's a testament to not only your ability to play the guitar, but your, your technical ability to design something like that, that you could actually play. Well, when you're a guitar player, I guess it's sort of like uh, if you were a race car driver, you would uh, build your car around your specs. You know? Exactly. You, you know exactly. all about it. Yeah. 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 And I've been, so, listen, listen, that I, I cannot give enough credit to Ibanez and the builders in Japan. These guys were the ones that I didn't know what the guitar was going to look like. They did the illustration that I approved and then they built it. There was three guys and, and one of them did the, all the illustrations. One of them built it and then one of them did all the electronics. And, and, you know, Steve just sits at home going, okay, when am I getting it? <laughs> <laughs> I just want a glimpse of it. Show me what it's going to look like. Guitar, hurry up. <laughs> so how, how much heavier is it than a regular guitar? It wasn't built to be pleasant. Okay. <laughs> you know, it, I don't even know if it's meant to be worn. You know, it's, it's, <clears throat> when I got it, we, you know, we went through a lot of iterations of stands yeah you know and the first straps were going around my shoulder and stuff and it, it was just too much so then thomas nordig my brilliant tech designed this strap that goes around my waist so the entire weight of the hydra rests on my waist and oh wow this, this is fantastic because and it sits it's so it's surprising well you you saw well you'll see but it sits really nice when you're wearing it yeah but it's heavy, so uh, your equilibrium is off. You know, like sometimes when I play and I'm really getting into the zone, I, I kind of do this little swaying thing. <laughs> I would go right over if I did that. It's like if you take a step to the right, the Hydra thinks you, you're going to New York. You yeah. Know? And it'll take you all the way there if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So and I saw a video of yours, the, the Hydra Bites, too. 
Yes, the Hydra box. <laughs> and and recently it was well before the I, I well I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, that was a funny little bit. What what happened was you, you see the clip I showed you where I'm using my thumb. Yeah. On the base neck. Well, <coughs> I doing that for hours and hours without a callus, you know, yeah. it, 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 it tears, tears it up, you know, you get a blister and then it breaks. And, and then my other hand was, um, I had to do these, all those chords in the chorus and all that stuff. They're not being picked because my hand was off doing yeah. something else. So you, I had to practice like hammering. To, so it's like this whole part of my finger uh, just got, you know, it just gets blistered. And then, cause you didn't, there's not enough time to build a callus. Yeah. So those were the bites. <laughs> it's just my joke. <coughs> so is there any other songs? I mean, I know they're all your babies, but is there any other songs that you just go, I love that song? Well, I am one of those guys that feels that it's very healthy to love what you do. Mm -hmm. So I have no problem saying I really love my music. I really love it. I don't think it's the best, obviously. That's, but I'm really appreciative that I can even make it. I get very excited when I feel like I've hit, I've hit like uh, the mark melodically in my mind, which means that's a good melody. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's hard to say because it's, it changes. Like for instance, uh, for a while, little pretty was uh, my favorite because it's just obtuse, you know, it's got these yeah. rich chords and, and it was a kind of thing where you start playing something and, and uh, you have to let, you have to get out of the way, you know, like for instance, okay. I got my my John Petrucci. Nice. Yeah. Oh shit! I can't play. I forgot. <laughs> um, I, I can't. Sorry. That's fine. That's so, fine. What I was gonna say is, um, so when I was doing Little Pretty, it was just these chords that I had recorded on the shelf, but when I would listen to them and I'd play them, they, they capture you. So this, this is a great way to write a song where you invest your, uh, your psychological attention, you know, I mean, not attention, you 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 embrace the harmonic atmosphere of what you're doing. You know, you, exactly. you become part of the music, so to speak. So you listen carefully. And when I was doing that with little pretty, it, it tells you where, where it wants to go. So because those chords were kind of obtuse and they were capturing an atmosphere and an attitude, then I got to get out of the way. And what I mean by that is so many times the, the intellect and the mind gets in the way and it starts throwing you off. It says things, well, well, are, are people going to like this? You know, are, is this going to be a hit? You know, how mm -hmm. am I going to? So these are all deterrents to that space that you just captured. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I completely so, do. Yeah. So, but when you get out of the way and you just let, you allow your ear to follow what it's doing, but where, where, where the music is pulling it, so to speak, then you can create something that's very dimensional, you know? So with Little Pretty, that, that I couldn't believe, uh, for me at least, you know, I, 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 I talk as though, <laughs> well, it's funny, I, re I read this article once where the guy said he was he was commenting on a dj and he said uh that dj is like steve Vai. he thinks his music is so much deeper than it is <laughs> i thought about that i thought yeah he's right you know <laughs> uh, i do think it's deeper than anybody else why wouldn't i you know so yeah so i love when i feel like i've allowed that deepness to um manifest yeah now, but but thing is to somebody else it might just be like this is crap this is noise and that's okay you have to get out of the way you know yeah. you know that it came through you and it felt good that's all you got to know yeah. and 
uh, so Little Pretty was one of those, especially the solo section. I, I, that solo just is so interesting to me. So then, um, uh, then I kind of started listening to Zeus and Chains a lot, you know, because a lot of people were commenting on it. And so maybe that's now my favorite, but it kind of moves around. That's okay. I mean, you, you, you kind of, I feel like as an artist, cause I'm the same way with my photography and my writing, yeah. you look at something so long and you go, okay, I got to look at something else. Yeah. Cause if you, you gotta, don't, you, you just, you pick it apart. Yeah. And um, picking things apart is not necessarily a bad thing based on what your intentions are yeah you know like if your intentions if your intentions are to go deeper in the uh the the message or the the atmosphere or the the whatever it is that then you can you can pick at it forever you know what i mean and uh and that's fine but if your intention is to sort of sabotage what you have in order to make it be something that it's not for other people yeah then you're picking it apart. Then, then, then you're you're compromising um, the the integrity of the song. I, I that's how I see it. No, it's the same thing with the photo. Like that photo I showed you of of you. You know, uh -huh. I tried to make it black and white. I tried to adjust the colors. I darkened the edges. And at some point, you just go stop screwing it up. I have the black and white also. Did you send that out? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, I have that one too. Yeah. 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 So, but, but here, here's the thing, Eric, as you know, when, when you're connected to your create, your, your, your unique creativity, you know, when it's done, mm -hmm. you know, when, okay, that's it, you know, and, and pe people ask occasionally, how do you know when something's done? And it, you just know, I, I don't know, you know, that, that you just, when you're writing, and it's time to put a period, you know that the period goes there. And it's just something up here and it just comes natural. It's not something you, yeah. you consciously think about. Yeah. 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 So I, I wanted to go someplace different with you now. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is about the movie Crossroads. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, how did you get that part? And when they came to you, did they say, we want you to be in this and we want you to write the song for the battle? They're really okay. Pretty much like that. Um, well, what had happened was um, Ry Cooter was scoring the film. Yeah, and there was that dual scene. Mm -hmm. and he, he needed a hotshot guitar player, so he because they were trying to get that dual scene to work with other guitar players, and it was just turning into jams. Okay, there was no drama. There was no ham. You know. So. And and, and then I got the. Did Ralph Macchio, was he able to pull some of the, I, he's not a guitar player, is he? Nope. Okay. He's, he's as much of a guitar player as I am a karate kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so what happened was Rye was looking for somebody for this part and he called Guitar Player Magazine. And they, at that time, the Attitude song had appeared in the magazine as a little flexi disc. Yeah. So they played it for him over the phone and he said, okay, uh, that's the guy. Yeah. And I got a phone call from Ry Cooter. It was stunning. And he came out to my house and, and he played, he showed me the script and explained what they were doing. And um, I read the script and I said, sure, I, I could do that. So we built the track and then uh, the director came in, Walter Hill, and he loved it. Uh, and he asked me if I wanted to play the part in the film. And that's pretty much how that all happened. And then I don't think a lot of people realize that you were a part of the Ghost of Mars soundtrack either. Yeah. You did two songs on it. Did you actually work with John Carpenter for that soundtrack? Yeah. Wow, that's cool because he's he's a really good musician. I mean, a lot of people don't really know that. They know him from the director side, but they don't know that he's a really good musician. He's very he's he's very into music and Yeah. Lot, I think I mean, you'd have to fact check this, but I think a lot of his films he scores his own music he does he does yeah so i know for ghost of mars i, I got the call and uh this was a long time ago and i i did a lot of stuff like this you know here and there i'd get a call and if i could and if i liked it i'd go and do it 
but I, I, man, the opportunity to work with that guy, holy yeah. roll. He is just as brilliant as they come. I love his work. And um, it was great. It was kind of, uh, I don't know. Did you ever like, um, you ever see like old reels of the Beatles where George Martin is like dressed like he's in his tie? And yeah. And then everything is kind of like, there's maybe not a lot of discussion, you know, and it's like a real producer role. And yeah, I don't, know if, I don't know if George Martin was entirely like that, but that's my image. Well, Carpenter was kind of like that. Hmm. You know, I didn't feel like it would make one bit of difference if I said to him, the thing, the thing, you know, that movie that you yeah. made. Yeah. <sighs> you know. So yeah. recently, though, recently I saw you were on the red carpet for the new Foo Fighters movie. Yeah. Oh, my God. That was so much fun. Holy shit. Studio 666. And you were uh, you went and saw the premiere, but yeah. you actually were a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So wh wh how did you get that part? Well, I live I live in a, a, a town. Uh, there's a lot of um, musicians live around here. And yeah. Dave, Dave Grohl live, lives right over there, you know, yeah. for many years. And I'd run into him. I, uh, now and then, and, you know, sometimes it was at a professional function and then, you know, eventually, you know, you're, you're doing a gig and he's in the gig and stuff like that, but he's just such a great guy. And he's so, he's real simple and funny and like a teenager, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just brutally talented, you know, just totally in, in what he does. It's, in, it's inspiring. So, uh, so what happened? So, okay. Uh, one one day I was out jogging and I was coming into my house and he drove by and he stopped and uh, right in front of my house and we just started talking and I invited him in and we uh, took him for a little tour of the studio and stuff and he said we're making a film right down the street here now when I say down the street here I, I you could almost see the house <laughs> you know, like, and this is a house that he lived in for a while yeah and it, while while he was having another house worked on and uh it is a creepy ass place, man. I got to tell you, I didn't even know something this creepy was by me. It was like the perfect place to film this movie. So uh, he said, you know, we're doing this scene and it's this scene where uh, I'm, I'm kind of crazy and I'm trying to show the guys what to play, but I'm playing all this crazy stuff, you know, and uh, can you do it? <laughs> I said, sure. And I, I walked over and uh, it, one of the funnest parts was when they had to paint my hands to match his. Yeah. He's got all these tattoos and stuff. So we had to sit there together for, you know, quite a <laughs> while while they, you know. So we got actually finally got a chance to sit down for some hours and, and get, you know, really chat. But uh, it was it was a kind of scene where. When you're shooting a film like this, it's bam, 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 mm -hmm. no messing around, you know. So I remember. Um, I just wanted to do my part and be as good as I can and get out. You know what I mean? I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to slow things down. And of course you sit around all day. <laughs> That's what happens in the movies. Yep. Which was fun because I get to hang with the, you know, with the foos and they're just yeah. a, a group of guys, you know? So then they came time to shoot my scene. And um, what was funny was I had to play Dave's guitar, which is nothing like the kind of guitars I play. Yeah. You know, it's a semi hollow quasi jazz guitar. Yeah. You know? So I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> you know? and then it was tuned funny uh, okay. because, the, you know, uh, and there's no time to even like, you know, so I think that it was weird. It's like the E string was E flat and the A string okay. was B flat or something. So I'm just like, okay, I got it. And then, oh, by the way, you got to play this riff. That's a sort of a, part of the song that uh, was the demonic song. And I'm like, okay. So I learned the riff real quick and I could plug into any amp I want, but all the amps they had there were like fenders and these kinds of amps that just don't have the, the kind of thing that I usually reach yeah. for. So luckily I brought my distortion pedal, <laughs> a wah -wah. That yeah. was the only thing I brought. Um, and my distortion didn't have a battery. <laughs> <laughs> Weird stuff. So I was just like, whatever, you know, let's do it. And I blasted through and we had a great time. And 
I, I, when I saw it in the movie, I almost died because <laughs> of Dave. Yeah. <laughs> he's going like, you know, he's doing all these great faces while my hands are going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was that, the, that's, that song, is that the one that they actually released? There was a, no, they, 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 I don't know exactly what their uh, uh, plans are, but they released a record, a yeah. full Foo Fighters record. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, Dave has done the soundtrack for the, parts of the soundtrack for the movie. Uh-huh. And um, but I don't know about their release plans for any of that uh, source music. OK, because there was recently he had just released that um, March of the Insane from uh, Dream Widow. And I, I didn't know if that was part of it, which is it's a totally different sound that a song that you would never expect from them. It's kind of a Sepultura kind of different uh, well, you know, I, I haven't heard it, but the the, I, I guess I can talk about this stuff now. Um, you know, there's a song in the film that they need to finish, or Dave wants it finished yeah. because it unleashes all these demons or something. And there is some pretty peculiar riffs going on. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like uh, Foo Fighters. No, and that's just me listening. You know, I I don't know that you know, but. Um, that could be the song that because that was part of the riff that I had to play. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be uh, what you're referring to. Yeah. But it's not the Foo Fighters. No, no, no. <laughs> definitely not. This song is definitely not the Foo Fighters. Yeah, but, no. you know, to me, it speaks speaks volumes about Dave, because to me, I musically, the Foo Fighters were never a huge band that I really liked. But Dave Grohl is a very much the historian and a preservationist of music itself and so i love what he has done to help preserve the history of music i know i I totally agree and the amazing thing about him is he does it so innocently he does he's the he's i read someplace maybe it was rolling stone that he's considered to be the the most important rock musician of the 21st century and I don't doubt that. And one of the wealthiest, but uh, yeah. you never know, you know, like he's here at my house looking at like my guitars and it's like, oh, I can't, I can't play those. You know, he, he's really um, humble that way. Yeah. He's yeah. inspired. He knows what he wants and he's got a great ear. Yeah. You know, a great musical ear. And just because of the, 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 the simple understanding that I want to do this and now I'm doing it. That's yeah. Dave Grohl, you know, yeah. and that's the sign of uh, a prolific, inspired person. Yeah, I exactly. Do this, so guess what? I'm doing it. <laughs> yep. Well, Most speaking- people go, I want to do this, but I can't because fill in the blank. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, speaking of inspiration, I wanted to ask you about your um, the Steve I Academy. Oh, I think it's a great I think it's a fun thing. And I. I think it's a good way for you to inspire others. I um, love it. I, I just love it because um, along with my uh, attraction to being a musician my whole life, I, I always liked the, the teaching for some reason. Yeah. And because um, that's how I learned. I learned from great teachers through my life. And uh, the academy, the we call it the Vi Academy, but it's, you know, it's like, it's fantastic. We're working on number six coming up and we usually pick a, like a resort type hotel in a really cool area where there's things going on and people can do things. And we usually, we will get between a, a close to 200, sometimes more people. Wow. We, call them campers. we affectionately call them campers. Yeah. And it's great because for like four days, we, we, we get all these incredible, um, very accomplished players to come and give uh, these master classes of sorts where you can talk to them and you can, you know, pick their brains. And we've had so many great uh, players over the years. And this year we got, um, I've got Nuno coming, Billy Sheehan, um, Larry Mitchell, Yvette Young. Uh, We're still waiting for a couple of confirmations, so I don't want to go too far. Yeah. But um, there's many classes going on all day from these, uh, wonderful just simple clinicians too like I've, I've been able to mine all the mi uh, fields and find all the um really good teachers you know and and 
each camp has a basic theme to it. And this camp that's coming out up, it's called Find Your Note. And this is when I, uh, we, we're going to all focus on how to find your, your unique voice on the instrument, you know, and players of all sorts of um, levels are uh, attend, you know, some, some people, they can hardly really play. And some people are just like, you don't need me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I love the most is uh, I play with every one of them. Uh, it takes like four nights of four hours a night, but one by one, they all come up and it's just a jam. For <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And I really love that because it's an intimate space, you know, and you get to really explore that intimate space of music creating with another person. Well, I, I don't know about you, but for me, teaching people different things is very inspiring to me too. I mean, it, it gets me really jammed up when I get, when I'm teaching somebody something and I see that they're, they're learning and they're having fun that, that gets me going too. Yeah. Because the way that we learn is by teaching. When you're teaching, you're also learning. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's nice because there's nothing nicer than contributing to the quality of somebody else's life. Exactly. And if you got the goods and they're looking for them, that's nice because that's how it works for all of us. Yeah. yeah. So everybody go pick up in Violet um, and look for you to have some tour dates coming this fall. Correct. Yep. Okay. We got locked in. I'm sp- Yep. Yeah. And, and I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully we'll get to see somebody come up on stage with you and, and do a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So everybody that's listening, when I come to a town near you, bars one through 68, I don't need you. Bar 67 and six, six never there, you go. there you go. There you go. <laughs> right on. All right, brother. Well, we'll see you when we're, when I'm in town, come on by. I will. I will. I'll, uh, I'll talk to Steve and see if we can just come by and say hi. So. Yes, he'll take care of it.